has been argued that if you colonize, if you're a civilization that colonizes the galaxy, that it's a self-limiting exercise. Why? Because here you go. You ready? We start here on Earth. It's you and me, boy. All right? And you take that planet, I take this planet. And now we have both have offspring that are just like us. And we want more planets. All right? We reach a point where expansion is not possible because we are warring with ourselves to gain the territory that each other has obtained. So it has been argued sociologically that the very act of wanting to colonize is self-limiting against successful colonization of the galaxy. Because to colonize the galaxy has to be done in an organized way. All right, you take this sector, I take this sector, but if I want territory and I want it now, and my kids want it now, I want that territory, not this other one. In fact, I want it all. That kind of attitude breeds violence. It breeds war, intragalactic war. So it may be that the very kind of civilization that could peacefully colonize a galaxy is not the kind of civilization that would colonize the galaxy at all. Oof. Um, I mean, the moon of Mars often th th thought of as like, is this some escape, escape, escape hatch for rich people? But I, it, it, it won't be that at all. It's, um, in anyone who, for, for the early people that go to, go to Mars, it'll be far more dangerous. I mean, really, it's, it, it kind of reads like Shackleton's ad for Antarctic explorers. You know, it's like, um, Difficult, dangerous, good chance you'll die. <laughs> Excitement for those who survive. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and uh, I think there's not many people who actually want to go in the beginning, because all those things I said are true. Uh, but there'll be some who, who will, for, for whom the excitement of the frontier and exploration exceeds the concern of danger. Um, what issues should our next generation of leaders be focused on solving? What else is coming down the line? Um, well, I mean, there, there are other things that are on a longer time scale. The, um, and obviously the things that I believe in, like extending life beyond Earth, making life multiplanetary. Um, and I'm a big believer in sort of um, Asimov's foundation series or the principle that you, you really want to, um, you know, I recommend reading the foundation series, but it's like if if you if you know that there's a there's likely to be we don't know but there's likely to be another dark ages which it seems my guess is there probably will be at some point. Yeah, of course I want to back up. Of course, let's be a multi-planet species. Fine, right, but but I I would do it for different reasons. I would do it because it's cool, not because I want to protect human the human species from extinction. No, that wouldn't be the reason to do it. Uh, can I tell you why? Please. List every reason why you think we go extinct. Uh, one, we trash Earth. Another, and we can't live off of it anymore. Uh, an asteroid is coming. There's some nanobot gone astray, okay? Pandemic. Pan uh, virus pandemic, okay. Um, I'm, not, I'm not predicting that we're about to enter dark ages, but that there's some probability that we will, particularly if there's a third world war. Um, then we want to make sure that there's enough of a, of a seed of human civilization somewhere else uh, to bring civilization back um, and perhaps uh, shorten the length of the Dark Ages. Um, you know, I think that's why it's, imp that it's important to get a self-sustaining base, um, ideally on Mars, because Mars is far enough away from Earth that a, that, um, a war on Earth, the Mars base might survive. It's more likely to survive than a moon base. But I think a moon base and a Mars base um, that, um, that could perhaps help regenerate life back here on Earth would be really important. And to get that done before a possible World War III. We want to be a multi-planet species. Mars would be the one because it's a 24-hour day. It's got seasons. We, we would have to terraform it first, but then we all move there. We just ship a billion people there. Here's my, here's my point. Whatever it takes to terraform Mars and ship a billion people there, it's got to be easier to deflect the asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes to terraform Mars to turn it into Earth, 
if you had the power of geoengineering to do that, then you have the power of geoengineering to turn Earth back into Earth. Um, you know, last, last century we had two massive world wars, three if you count the Cold War. I think it's unlikely that we will never have another world war again. Um, there probably will be at some point. Or if we have another one, it'll be the last. Yeah, it, it, it just could be radioactive rubble. You know? um, so, again, I'm not predicting. <laughs> it just seems like, well, if you say given enough time, will it be most likely? Given enough time. This, this, is, this is, has been our pattern in the past. Uh, so, um, like I really believe in the zeroth law of Asimov's zeroth law. You know, take the set of actions most likely to support um, humanity in the future. Um. And if an asteroid is coming that you can't deflect, which would surprise me if you could ship a billion people to Mars, you just let them all die? What? What is that? What you you plan to? You gonna let all the Earth people die and the Mars people survive just so you can save the species? Don't save everybody. I was talking about tunnels for years and years, um, for probably five years or four years at least. Whenever I'd give a talk and people would ask me about what opportunities do you see in the world, I'd say tunnels. Can someone please build tunnels? <laughs> so after four or five years of begging people to build tunnels, <laughs> and still no tunnels, I was like, okay. I want to build a tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> so like maybe, maybe I'm missing something here. Um, so um, yeah, so I was like basically talking people's ears off of tunnels for, for several years, and then said, "Well, let's find out what it takes to build a tunnel." And um, yeah, so I started digging a tunnel. I wanted to start the tunnel uh, from where I could see it from my office at SpaceX. So I, start, I said, "Well, let's just." Carve off a part of the parking lot across the road, so I can see if it's, if anything's happening or not. <laughs> um, and then we named our first boring machine uh, Godot, because <laughs> I kept waiting for it. It never came. <laughs> um, finally, it did, um, and and we got it going. And um, now we're making good progress. Um, and uh, we, we're finding the company for merchandise sales. Um, so uh, thank you for anyone who's bought our flamethrower. Uh, <laughs> you will not be sorry, or maybe you will. <laughs> it won't be boring. <laughs> we, we have a video, I think, uh, here of the latest vision for the Boring Company in terms of how it planned, you know, the, the oh, hopes cool. of the I didn't, revolution. I even didn't even know this. Great. <laughs> Added seats. A 140 meter wide space rock is large enough to destroy a city, and if it were on a path to collide with Earth in less than a year, the only thing to do would be evacuate the impact zone. But if we are lucky enough to spot an asteroid 7 to 10 years out, NASA would have enough time to try deflecting the object, which they could do a number of ways. First, NASA could launch a spacecraft to act as a battering ram. And if the asteroid is far enough out, it would only need to be pushed a few centimeters off course to avoid hitting Earth. NASA is in the early stages of DART, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, which will try out this approach by trying it on a non-threatening asteroid called Diddy Moon, which will pass near Earth in 2022. Another method would be using something called a gravity tractor, which pulls the asteroid in a new direction and points it away from Earth. The third option would be to go full Hollywood and use a nuclear device to vaporize part of the surface. 